Hello, everybody. This is the latest animal welfare webinar from the Animal Welfare Group here at 42BR Barristers. My name is Marcia Hyde and I'm part of the Animal Welfare Group. I'm joined today by Richard Furness, who is our joint head of chambers. He's also a member of the Animal Welfare Group. Afternoon, everyone. And Richard and I are both delighted to be joined tonight by Carol Day, who is a senior solicitor at Lee Day and is involved in a lot of our wildlife case law and represents a lot of different um, bodies who are interested in that. So, Carol, thank you for coming. Pleasure to be here. It's lovely to see you. Um, just so that you have a little rundown about how the webinars work, the webinar has been recorded. It will be up on our website. I think we've got a YouTube website, haven't we, Richard? Thanks. Where all of the um, webinars are posted up on, it should be up in a few days for you to look at if you want to hear us again, because we're so interested. <laughs> um, the other thing is that we will do questions at the end. Um, please, if you put them in the question and answer box, the Q&A box, which should be on the bottom, the bottom of your screen, add your email address, because if we don't get time to finish them, we will respond by email as soon as we can. Or if we don't know the answer, we'll go away and look it up and email it to you. So tonight we are going to look at wildlife and how we use the law or try to use the law to protect wildlife. It's a huge area, isn't it, guys? Yeah. yeah. It's a massive area. <laughs> and so it's going to be a bit of a sprint through the general law what kind of law we use, what statutes we use, and look at some specific case law. Um, we are going to look firstly at three reports which tell us what the state of our wildlife is, both in the UK but worldwide. Um, then we're going to look at four particular topics in more detail, which will be protecting habitats, uh, a couple of controversial uh, topics, badger culling, raptor persecution, and then we're going to look at reintroducing wildlife. So that's a lot. <laughs> so we better get started. So I think, Richard, you would, I'll, I'll, you I'll would just kick yes, off, weren't you? Marcia, you're quite right. We'll really only be able to skim the surface of these topics for now, and we'd hope to do webinars in the future with more detailed mm. analysis of them. So bear with us if you already know a lot of what we're about to say. We've got a very mixed group, I know, listening in. And we'd like to just have a general introduction, I think, to wildlife protection this evening. Uh, and so I'll start by um, talking about the State of Nature report. And for, for anyone who doesn't know, the State of Nature partnership is a collaboration of, I think, more than 60 partners um, and there's conservation NGOs, there's research institutes, there's statutory nature conservation bodies, et cetera, et cetera. And this partnership every three or four years produces a report on the state of nature in the UK, uh, but also Crown Dependencies, which meet, just means Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man, um, but also overseas territories. So we're talking about the Cayman Islands and Bermuda, where there are a lot of the diverse species are there as well. Um, but anyway, the most recent report was published in September last year. And what I want to do is just mention what the headlines are of, of that report. And there are five headlines, and then there are another five um, another five broad areas where things might be improved. So these are the headlines. Just over 10,000 species were assessed using red list criteria. Uh, 151 are now extinct in the UK and almost 1,500 more are threatened with extinction in the UK. It's number one. Number two, the abundance of 753 terrestrial and freshwater species has fallen by 19% since 1970. Thirdly, while less is known about abundance and distribution in the sea, 
the abundance of 13 species of seabird, which have been specifically monitored, has fallen by 24% since 1985. Number four, the UK distributions of nearly 5,000 invertebrate species have decreased, on average by 13% since 1970. And fifthly, the distribution of 54% of flowering plant species and 59% of mosses and liverworts, called bryophytes together, have decreased since 1970. So that's the bad news. Is there some slightly good news? Well, the UK is a party to a new set of international biodiversity targets in five broad areas that I wanted to mention. First of all, the first one's improving species status. What that means is it's targeted conservation of individual species, uh, and that's effective only when it can be applied to a high proportion of the population. Secondly, increasing nature-friendly farming, forestry and fisheries. And the report says that all three have improved over the last 20 years, although there's a long way to go. Uh, and about a fifth of farmland uh, in the UK is in environmental schemes, but only part of that can reasonably be considered as nature-friendly farming. 44% uh, of woodland is certified as sustainably managed, and the success story is that more than half of marine fish stocks were sustainably harvested, uh, which has had a measurable positive impact in terms of population health there. The third target is expanding uh, and managing protected areas. Uh, at present, only 11% of the UK is in protected areas. By no means all of that is well managed for nature. And the target, though, is to increase that to 30% by 2030. Fourth, increasing ecosystem restoration. A good example of this is the restoration of degraded peat land, where only 25% of peat land is in good condition in the UK. The restoration of carbon-rich habitats has obvious benefits, not only for nature, but for climate change mitigation as well. And the scale and speed of this needs to be increased. It leaves a lot to be desired. Funnily enough, in the news only today is uh, the news that the National Trust is removing mushrooms from its menus in all its establishments, because the vast majority of mushrooms sold in the UK are grown on peat, and so they're abandoning them for en environmental reasons. And that, that's, that's the latest news today. <laughs> and then finally on this, following on from that, a coordinated response is required. In other words, coordinating action to restore nature with not only action to mitigate and adapt to the uh, impact of climate change, uh, but also making sure people's needs for food, energy and access to nature are met. So that's where we are, Marcia, on state of nature. Wow, so depressing in some ways, but people trying to do... People trying to do something do. about it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Carol, I think you wanted to look at the... Um, the death from findings on wild bird populations. Yes. Is sorry. that equally? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's a bit more doom and gloom. I'm sorry, yes. And also the figure you were saying, Richard, about seabirds, that's yeah. all obviously before bird flu. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. So yes. things is, like gannet populations, yes, which have plummeted. And, and yeah. do plummet, but, you know, yeah. it's really, um, yeah. really, really yeah. worrying. Yeah. Yeah. No, yes, I just wanted to mention the, uh, the death for wild bird indicators, um, two of which are particularly worrying. The first is the breeding woodland bird index for the UK. And breeding woodland birds are down by 37%. And oh. that means they are our most rapidly declining group. So that's things like the lesser spotted woodpecker. Yeah. And we all, we all, I think a lot of us would have seen the greater spotted woodpecker. It comes to our feeders a lot now. It's learned that it can get, you know, it likes fat balls and things like that. But the lesser spotted woodpecker is doing very, very badly. Um, as is the spotted flycatcher and the willow tip, both down, all three down by over 80% since 1970. God, that's massive, but the worst it? one is the breeding farmland bird index, which um, is down by 60% between 1970 and 1980. The, the major losses early on in the 1970s, 1980s, with massive intensification of agriculture, loss of hedgerows, but also things like increasing uses of pesticides yeah. and fertilisers has massively um, had an impact. So corn bunting, grey partridge, uh, turtle dove, tree sparrow, all down by over 90% since 1970. So 
absolutely decimated. But the point I wanted to make is kind of we get a little bit blasé about numbers. And I've heard these numbers in my career for many, many years. It sort, yeah. sort of goes over your head a bit. But I do remember, I am old enough to remember walking through nature reserves and seeing clouds of butterflies yes. you know, on yes. either side of me. And, you know, the old urban myth about driving on the motorway and having bugs on the windscreen. I remember that as well yeah. and having to yeah. clean the windscreen the, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. motorway journey. So, you know, I think it's just important to remember that we hear these numbers all the time, but there are there are stories behind all of those numbers yeah. to the point that some of our children won't even know what a hedgehog is at the rate we're going. So yeah. you know, really worrying statistics. They are. They're really worrying. Um, I was going to briefly look at the third report, which, again, is a bit doom and gloom, but does make positive recommendation. And that's a um, the state of migratory species. This report came out in February of this year. It's under the auspices of the Conservation of Migratory Species Convention 1979. Um, it has it has on it, it has lists of species, all sorts of species, fish, birds, whales, hoof animals, elephants, almost 1,200 um, species on two different lists. Um, Appendix one list, has 180 listed species, which are considered endangered. Uh, Appendix two is the rest, which are classified either as uh, in times of favorableness or unfavorable conservation status. And they are covered by international agreements, side agreements between some national countries and memorandums of understanding. And the, this 20, 24 report was the first report of its kind and the findings for that generally um, over one in five of the CMS listed species are threatened with extinction 44 percent have a decreasing um, population trend 82 percent of the 180 species in appendix one are threatened with extinction and that they are the most protected ones mm -hmm. and they are the most threatened with extinction. 76% of species in Appendix um, 1 are declining. 18% of species in Appendix 2 are threatened and 42% of their populations are declining. Um, the, what you were talking, Richard, about um, fish, the um, CMS listed fish are in really serious peril. 97% of CMS listed species are threatened with extinction and decreasing in abundance, 90% average decline in CMS listed fish populations since 1970. I mean, dire straits mm. for fish, and that includes whales, dolphins, all of the beautiful... Cetaceans, yeah. Yeah, so it's really... Um, it is quite scary. In addition to that, one of the other findings was that 399 species, which are globally threatened, are not even on the lists. So one of the recommendations is that those species um, should be put on the lists to be protected, to give them, to give them special status. The main threats come from um, what you would expect, loss of habitat, fragmentation of the habitats, um, barriers to migratory movement. So for example, road building, big projects like that, pollution, increasingly light as well as noise, as well as the other stuff, plastic, etc. Climate change, invasive species as well. But the main one which came out on top, which was decreasing and depleting our wildlife is over exploitation. Really? Is the biggest factor, which was quite a surprise in the report, the people who, who wrote it. So, hunting, fishing, incidental capture of non target species, particularly with fish. Yes, yeah. yeah. you know, fish nets. Catching, catching them in fish nets, all of that. And that came out as the top um, threat um, to wildlife, to migratory wildlife. So the recommendations were protect, connect, and restore habitats, because what the convention did 
and what we have done in law, and I know you're going to talk about habitats in a minute, mm. is create specially designated areas to help wildlife, to help habitats, to increase biodiversity. So one of the main recommendations is to expand those areas and join them up. Mm. It's about like having corridors down to the sea, as it were, mm. so that animals can migrate. And so the 30% target. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, tackle over exploitation. So that's, you know, getting a grip, particularly on our fishing industries, because we simply just overfish. And we do things like, you know, I think there's um, big moves to make this illegal trawling the bottom of the yeah. sea. Yeah. You know, that just kills off so many other species. Um, reduce damage to the environment from pollution and light. Effect, you know, make effective message for climate change. And as I said before, put those other species on the list that aren't there. Yeah. So there's always, a, we all look at it and there's a plan. So it's about putting the plan in action, isn't it? Always the way, isn't it? Always the way. Yeah. And that's about resources and money, isn't it? Of course. So, shall we look then um, at habitats? At habitats, Carol. And shall, shall I just say something about the basic laws that are involved, and then Carol can? Uh, yeah, absolutely, it. absolutely. So obviously, the master uh, act of parliament is the Wildlife and Countryside Act, nineteen eighty-one. It's massively detailed with lots of shapes. <laughs> yes. So I'm just going to say what it is, rather than going yes. through it. There's things that don't really affect what we're talking about very much today, like public rights of way. Um, but part two is about nature conservation, countryside national parks, sites of special scientific intre uh, interest, limestone pavements, stop people removing limestone, national and marine nature reserves, et cetera, et cetera. And then part one which is sections one to 27, again, very detailed, but basically it's about protecting, first of all, wild birds, their eggs and nests. So it's an offence to uh, disrupt them, but only in the close season. Uh, and uh, it, it's if it's necessary, for example, to protect crops, you're allowed to um, interfere with wild birds, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's protection of other animals as well, and they're listed in the schedule, Schedule 5, and it runs from butterflies, as you were mentioning, Carol, earlier, mm. to otters and from mm. sandworms to dolphins and mm. sharks. So it's a wide variety of protected animals. It's a mass effect, isn't it? Absolutely. And again, protected plants from mosses to orchids. Uh, and then there's miscellaneous uh, provisions, possession of some pesticides, the powers of wildlife inspectors and the police, et cetera, et cetera. So as I say, this is the sort of master act that aims to protect, but with lots of exceptions. Um, Carol, I know you're going to talk about the habitats regulations in a moment and about special areas of conservation, special protection areas. So I'll leave that to you and I'll just mention uh, in this brief overview, hedgerows as well. Uh, and this is uh, the Environment Act 1995 and the hedgerows regulations made under that. Uh, and again, hedgerows are protected. They're protected because of their length, their location or their importance, historical importance or importance because they're scientifically important as well. Um, it, we could spend hours going through what all the... Uh, various criteria are, but you can only move, remove a hedgerow if it's under 30 years old, you're the owner of the hedgerow or you're a utility company that needs to remove it, and it doesn't fall into the protected categories that we've got there. You submit an application to local planning authority, and it decides whether it's going to give permission to remove it or issue a hedgerow retention notice. But that comes back yeah. to what you were saying, really, doesn't it, about certainly on farmland, yeah. one of yeah. the main reasons or a big reason for loss of um, farm birds is yeah. the hedgerows are destroyed. Absolutely. And a key issue is enforcement. <laughs> you know, the key, yeah, of course, yeah. There's no point having these things yeah. as they're in unless they're going to be enforced by the local planning authority. Yeah. And, and only a, a, a week or so ago, I was contacted by somebody exactly in that situation where the hedgerow, very important for species and amphibian, particularly the great crested newt, had been removed. Yeah. And looking to the local planning authorities to see if they were going to come in and do the job. Yeah, and, 
Well, we, we're waiting to hear. Yeah. I think it's crossed. Clear, but and yeah, I mean, enforcement right. is a key issue. And, and in fact, local planning authorities who are under a lot of pressure and don't have a lot of time to do things, if you make your application and don't get a response within 42 days, you can then remove yeah. the hedge oh, can no you? matter how important yeah. it is. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is quite frightening. Well, isn't it? okay. There so, you are. So yeah. habit, <laughs> habitats, Carol. Okay, habitats, Carol. I'm going to say just like two, two or three brief words about the habitats regulations, but then I was going to talk about a particularly important case uh, in this area because I do think it's going to be a case that we're going to hear more about in the future. So the habitats regulations, yeah, along with the Wildlife and Countryside Act, these really, I would say, probably those two are the the, the two biggest instruments that that we rely on in our in our practice. Um, and the Habitats Regulations 2017, along with the offshore Habitats yeah. Regulations, which uh, apply in the marine environment over 12 nautical miles, um, both implement, obviously, originally the Habitats Directive, which was, when we were part of the EU, was passed in 1992. Now, the regulations essentially cover, originally covered the designation of special areas of conservation, special protection areas. But now, obviously, what we're more uh, interested in really is the protection of those areas. And there's key elements of the regulations, particularly Regulation 63, which talks about the impact of plans and projects on those particular areas. And there's a huge body of EU case law around that, much of which has been referred to in our domestic courts. And so, therefore, is still binding, even though we've left the EU, uh, it's still binding on domestic courts. And, and we use it really. It's our, our bread and butter of cases that we, we use in our arsenal. Um, I did want to talk about one particular case um, because it, I think it is going to be very important. It's the case of Harris um, and the Environment Agency, uh, which was uh, decided in 2022. And this is a case that concerned the protection of uh, Catfield Fen in Norfolk. Uh, the Catfield Fen, it's a SSSI, it's got every designation going, SSSI, Special Area of Conservation. I think it's also an SPA and a Ramsar site has two priority habitats on the Habitats Directive, calcareous fens and alluvial forest, um, and important for species like the bittern, for the rough and for marsh harriers. Now, that area was owned by Mr and Mrs Harris, and they were very concerned about increasing levels of abstraction on the broads. Uh, and they were particularly concerned about the Environment Agency's decision when it was looking at, I think there were some 240 abstraction licenses covering the broads, but the Environment Agency decided to limit the investigation of that into just three SSSIs. And Mr and Mrs House particularly concerned about their own site, but also other sites as well. So they decide to issue a case against the Environment Agency. And they argued two grounds. They argued that the Environment Agency, by limiting the investigation of these abstraction licenses on just those three SSSIs, were acting in breach of Article 6.2 of the Habitats Directive, which aims to protect the deterioration of habitats and the disturbance of species, and also that the Environment Agency's decision was irrational. And that's a ground that we don't often use in the law. It's quite a tricky ground, um, often used alongside other grounds. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's difficult. It's a very high threshold to meet the irrationality threshold. Um, but the judge agreed with Mr and Mrs Harris in this case. Uh, he held that the Environment Agency's decision was in breach of Article 6.2, and also that they had acted irrationally in confining the investigation to just those areas when they knew there was a much bigger area yeah. of the broads that it actually was being impacted. But the really important thing about this case is not just the implications for that massively important site in itself, but it established about three or four really important points, which I think are going to be crucial yeah. going forward. One of them was the ongoing enforceability of the Habitats Directive post-Brexit. And of course, we've all been really worried about what's going to happen to the Habitats regulations. We're still worried. We know there's plans afoot to do things about it. Um, but the, one of the really good things about this judgment was that the judge held that Article 6.2 and Article 6.3 have ongoing enforceability. So you can rely on them directly before the courts uh, in terms of the uh, duty on public bodies. The second really important point was clarity around the duty that's imposed on public bodies and what, what that actually means. Um, I think it's Regulation 9.3 of the Habitats Regulation sets out the general duty on public bodies in terms of discharging their functions and how they have to do that um, with regard to the Habitats Directive. Now, the wording with regard to is normally quite weak. Yes, it is. It's normally kind of take it into account, consider it, but then, you know, carry on. But the judge in this case held that the, the, the duty was a strict one because the duty was to have regard to the requirements of the directive. Those requirements are mandatory. So in this situation, the judge said 
have regard to means must discharge. So that was really a very important point. A couple of other really important ones. A public body can't wait until damage has happened before they step in. Precautionary principle applies. They yeah. have to take steps before you have damage. And another good one, really topical at the moment, a lack of finance is not a reason for public bodies not to discharge their duties under the habitats regulations. So, you know, we know public bodies are really, really pressed, but in this situation, a lack of finances isn't, isn't a reason to, to not be able to comply. And finally, that the precautionary principle is a retained principle of EU law, really massively important principle. It is. I mean, Harris is such a win-win case, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, when I first started reading it, you know, I thought, oh, this is going badly. <laughs> and then you get to the end. And for anybody who wants to look at the case, if you look at was apparent the last four or five paragraphs, set it out completely, win, 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 win on all of the points you've just said. And it's it's um it's quite an unusual um win for um wildlife judgment. Just as Johnson, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. Great and judgment. uh <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, and as you say, a really important principle about retained E law, um, because in fact the habitat regulations weren't on the the list for a long, long time, were they? Uh, that were going to be saved. Yes. So that's interesting. Great. So we were then going to look at, I think, badger coming. Your, your, your specialist subject, Master. Uh, <laughs> badger coming. Shall, shall I just say what the law is very briefly first? Protection of badgers is obviously very important. Uh, badgers, brocks as they used to be known, are an integral part of British national history. And Britain has about 25% of all European badgers up there in Britain. So the starting point here is the protection of badgers in 1992. And again, this is just the starting point. It's an offence to kill, injure or take a badger or interfere with a badger's set. But the government has a policy of making England, and we're talking about just England now, free of bovine tuberculosis, tuberculosis in cattle. And Marcy will tell you whether that's scientific or unscientific, <laughs> but badgers in particular have been thought to be responsible for the spread of bovine TB. TB. And so the government licenses badger culling. And there are, I think, 61 areas of cull zones which cover about a quarter of England across, I think, 20 counties from Cornwall to Cumbria. So what has to happen is that a farmer-led company has to apply to Natural England for a licence. The licence is limited to a certain time of year, um, usually June to November, although each Cull is supposed to take only six weeks, no more than six weeks within that uh, particular period. But new licenses are being routinely granted. And the Badger Trust thinks that more than 200,000 badgers have been culled since 2013. The other thing is that cull areas are not made public. So you don't know if you see a badger that's uh, appears to have been deliberately killed. You don't know whether it's been done lawfully within a cull area because you don't know what the cull area is. So if you do see a badger that's been deliberately culled, the Badger Trust would like you to tell them and the police. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Badger culling is hugely controversial. Um, there is evidence, sufficient evidence, to suggest that badgers do and can transmit um, TB to cattle through contact. And I think that evidence is quite clear. Um, what isn't clear uh, and what is highly controversial is whether or not culling is um, effective, culling badgers is effective or more effective than vaccinating badgers vaccinating cattle, taking other biosecurity measures on farms, um, preventing um, the selling and movement of cattle at risk. Now, there is loads and loads of research about whether or not um, culling is effective. 
And like uh, Richard, you will know this from doing PI, and I think we all know this from doing law anyway, that in effect, science is not objective. Science is actually um, dependent upon who commissions it, or how you frame your project, how you frame your investigation, what you're looking for, what your judgments are. So Badger Collin is a classic example of a topic which has research on one side, so from Wild Justice, from the Beaver Trust, um, which will present evidence that um, badger culling is not working. In fact, there's a rich, recent evidence from a 2022 research from Lang et al., which says, actually, it's not making any difference. And the decline in the numbers of bovine, bovine TB started to happen before the culls even took effect. However, last week, the government relied on another huge um, piece of research, the Birch research, um, which says, oh, it's really effective. We're going to carry on doing it. So it's science interpreted with a political slant. It that's is. That's the long and short of it. Martin. It is. That's exactly right, Richard. And of course, you know, the there's a real division in the country. It was always a controversial topic, debated by public demand twice in, in Parliament. Um, lots of um, initial testing which didn't actually show that culling worked. The government's policy, as Richard said, is to eradicate bovine TB by 2030. Originally, one of the main ways of doing that was badger culling. Then there was the um, an important report, the Godfrey Review of the DEFRA strategy, and that that was twenty eighteen. That recommended that um, because of the politicised debate, farmers were not in fact doing what they could do also to help, like creating biosecurity um, on their farms. There is loads of stuff you can buy to make sure that, ranging from how you know you feed the cattle water by having buckets up high so that the badgers can't get to it. There's loads of um, stuff like that that farmers could be doing. Plus there was a, a continual selling of animals which were at risk. Now, there is no denying that um, bovine TB is hugely damaging to farmers economically um, because the government demands that farmers have to test regularly. And if they test positive, the herds can't move or they're slaughtered. And I think by about 2017, something like 33,000 cattle had been slaughtered. I think a lot more have now because of the TB crisis. But as Richard says, the 2023 figures for badger culling was over 210,000 uh, badgers that we've culled. And as I say, that's highly um, controversial, both in terms of the science and its efficacy, actually. So after the Godfrey Review, the Godfrey Review said, well, look, we've got to have a much more wider raft of measures, which included um, periodic intensive badger culling. But we had to do a lot of other things as well, improving biodiversity, um, stopping movements of cattle, etc. After that report was the government um, issued a next step report in March 2020. And that seemed to indicate a sea change, didn't it, Helen? Mm. From moving away <laughs> from badger culling as a main factor in limiting and controlling the disease and starting to look at badger vaccination as a way forward, along with cattle vaccination and the other measures that I've just talked about. Um, those who were opposed to culling were always of the view that vaccinating um, badgers was the best way forward. And I know the Zoological Society of London pioneered the first um, testing. And they, some of their early research showed that to be an effective method of controlling TB. Um, 
most of the case law, <laughs> however, on challenging the badger calls pretty much failed. I'm going to come on in a minute to moving the debate on, but I want to talk um, a little bit about the case law first. The main challenge in 2012 was the Badgers Trust. And that was the primary challenge saying that the coal policy was in effect illegal. Um, that failed. Um, 2014, again, a, a, an action brought by the Badger Trust um, which tried to force the government to maintain an independent expert panel to review the efficacy of badger culling. That again was refused. There have been some minor um, um, successes, as it were, depending on which side of the debate you're on. Uh, the 2020 Farmers Union action failed, which tried to overturn a decision to refuse them, refuse a license on um, some properties. And then there were the three Langton cases, mm. which were major cases. They were all, again, judicial reviews. A lot of the actions are come under judicial review. That's the main legal weapon, isn't it, to challenge all of the decisions that are made. So the third, there were three Langton cases. The first two failed. The third one went to um, a, to the court on the basis of challenging the next steps report and in effect trying to stop badger culling um, on two grounds the argument was that the state um, that the secretary of state had not taken into account the impact on biodiversity or the or the ecological impact which it was obliged to do under section 40 of the uh, natural environment and R rural communities act 2006 that failed as well. Mm. But Carol, I think you've got a positive. <laughs> you yeah, I, speak about a success in Northern Ireland. Yeah, I will. I, I was going to say a word about that. I mean, obviously, um, it's massively topical at the moment. We yeah. have consultation, yeah. um, which has got a very short response period. People might like to yeah. notice it closes on the 22nd of April. And yeah, Marcia, a massive move, so noticeable that from, 19, from 2021, we are moving away from lethal control to suddenly in a situation where, you know, <laughs> Massively back to lethal control. There's not one mention in the consultation paper of the Pre Protection of Badgers Act. Yeah. Not one mention of the Byrne Convention. Not one mention of the badger as a protected species or the, what the impact on badger populations might be. So, you know, a massive, massive start. And that was that. last Thursday. That was last Thursday. Popped out last Thursday. Yeah. So it's yeah. very, very topical. Yeah. I was going to talk about, yeah, obviously, um, this is uh, two cases taken by Wild Justice. The first case was a general badger case, and, and that was taken on the basis of the humaneness of the cull. That was sadly unsuccessful. But we did do um, a case for Wild Justice and the Northern Ireland Badger Group, uh, which we got the judgment for last year, which was successful. So I did want to say a word about that. So it isn't completely doom and gloom, because, yes, the, the kind of the, the courts are littered with unsuccessful badger cases, sadly. Um, but this was a case about the lawfulness of the consultation exercise in Northern Ireland. And um, in 2021, DARA uh, in Northern Ireland consulted the public on its strategy to control bovine TB. And throughout the consultation, they referred repeatedly to a business case, which they said formed the basis for the various different options that they were consulting the public on. Now, there are very long established in law principles of consultation. They don't just apply in environmental JR, they have apply across, across the board. The um, but, but they're called the gunning principles of consultation uh, after a case of that same name. And the first principle um, is that if you're consulting the public, you need to give them sufficient information to be able so that they can make an intelligent response to the consultation. That information has got to be available, accessible and understandable. And our client said, uh, Northern Ireland Badger Group said when they were responding to the consultation, well, you know, we can't actually respond to this consultation effectively because we haven't had sight of the business case. And everything around this consultation is saying how central it was to the options that were put forward, but we haven't seen it. Anyway, in 2022, DARA published its, its response to the consultation and it chose uh, a non-selective colour free ranging badgers. And again, it said that it had chosen that option on the basis of information in the business case. So while Justice and the Northern Ireland Badger Group um, applied for judicial review on the basis that the consultation was unfair, 
They said it was impossible for them to provide an intelligent response because they hadn't been party to all of the information that had been put before the minister. Now, the business case was actually disclosed through the uh, court process, and it was really interesting. When we saw it, it did have a host of really inf interesting information on it that Northern Ireland Badge Group would have used in its consultation. There were things like all of the financial costings were in there. There were various weightings given to wow. the different options. Massive non-disclosure then. Massive. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, the Badger Group was saying, no, we, we are a specialist body. We would have had views on that. Anyway, so... Uh, the judge uh, agreed on that ground. He said that the summary of the business case that had been provided in the consultation wasn't enough to enable people to, to reach an informed judgment that they should have actually had sight of the business case itself. There was a fourth consultation principle, which is all about conscientious consideration. And that's to do with the fact that before a decision maker makes a decision, they have to conscientiously take into account the points that have been made to them by people who've responded to the consultation. Now, the minister had said that humaneness was a really important point in the consultation exercise, but the Northern Ireland Badger Group had drawn attention. You were saying, Marcia, I don't know about the, the findings of the IEP, the Independent Expert yeah. Panel. Yeah. One of their findings was that 23% of the badgers killed in that study had taken more than five minutes to die. So they had said this is a particularly inhumane yeah. option. Yeah. Um, our client had raised that but it hadn't been drawn to the attention of the minister before he made that decision. So again, the judge felt that that was a crucial omission in the consultation process. And it was a really important point because when you looked at the weightings, the difference between the least humane option, shooting the badgers, and the most humane option, TVR, test, vaccinate and release, was very small. Really? So had the minister had that information in front of him and realising how long it had taken, how inhumane it was. Could have made a massive difference. Yeah, could have yeah. been balanced. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the judge was, was, was persuaded by that. So he quashed um, the decision to go for the free-ranging cull. And of course, because there's been no administration in Northern Ireland, there's really been no movement on that issue. Right, so of course. kind of the badges in Northern Ireland have been safe since right. then, which is, which is really great. Right. So that was a really good news story. So Excellent. We, we do eventually have a, at least we'll also, a fight in badger killing. Yeah, I mean, I think what is going to happen now because of this not new consultation issued last week is actually looked at, it's looking at targeted badger interventions in the high risk areas. Yeah. And that is... Prime, or, or, and the edge areas, yeah. and that's primarily southwest England. Yeah. Um, now there is a very, very strong anti-badger culling um, population down there, and I think we're going to see an awful lot more um, cases challenged um, because it looks like as if there's been a complete switch in in policy, doesn't it? Because the the, the government have been putting more money into um, making license. Giving making licenses easier to get to vaccinate to allowing more people to be trained to vaccinate to funding <laughs> funding and and then it's all suddenly yeah. changed last week yeah all so of we shall people, see all of those people who would have relied on that 2021 yes exactly paper and scaled up their exercises yes, exactly absolutely yeah, yeah. interesting yeah. so we better skip on haven't we we were going to uh, we've got two things left reintroducing wildlife or raptor persecution shall we do raptor persecution first yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and then come on to reintroduce is that all right Carl? um right who was going to you who's going to talk about raptor persecution i think i was going to talk a little bit about that sorry it's me again well no i'll uh, basically um wildlife and countryside act again protects all native wild birds and animals and plants um Section 16 allows for the issue of licenses which negate the illegality of some acts which would fall under, under the Act. Um, so what I found difficult about the, the birds under the Wildlife and Countryside Act is oh, the schedules are so confusing. <laughs> They're very complicated. Been so many times. Uh, so it really does have to find a long way round to try and find out which bird is on which schedule. Yeah. Um, but definitely hen harriers and white-tailed eagles are on um, schedule one, aren't they? The penalties under the Act are not very great, but we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, so the everybody knows that the raptor persecution is poisoning, trapping, shooting, disturbing nests, theft of chicks, theft of eggs, um, and poisoning is one of the big issues, isn't it? But you talk a little bit more about, about 
about raptor persecution from your angle, from a legal yeah, I mean, I can say a really, you know, quick, quick introduction. Yeah. You know, that yes. you've both no, got no, views no. on. No, yeah. No, 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 no. It's always a pleasure to talk about eagles. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, this is a, a massive area um, and, and we are very concerned about this. While Justice is very concerned about this and, and um, you know, we're hopeful to be that we can do more to help. But um, there is an annual report produced by the RSPB, the bird crime um, report, which looks at um, raptor persecution. And uh, I think the 2022 version of that said that there were 61 confirmed incidents of raptor persecution in the UK, 46 of which were in England. Um, and that's likely to be an underestimate, unfortunately, in that year, because a lot of birds uh, collected by DEFRA for bird flu testing then didn't have further tests done on them to see what their cause of death might be. But against that enormous number of incidents, there's only been two, well, there are only that year were two individuals convicted of raptor persecution, both of whom were gatekeepers. And of those incidents, 64, over 64% of them took place on land managed for game bird shooting, yeah. which is which is absolutely horrendous. I mean, th there were some terrible examples of two white-tailed sea eagles poisoned in Dorset. Um, many people remember that. A horrible story about four hen harrier chicks being stamped to death in North Yorkshire. And I mean, it was a terrible year for hen harriers. Uh, I think that year there were 24 hen harriers killed in persecution incidents. We just we just simply don't have enough hen harriers to lose 24. No, absolutely um, not. So it's it, it's a it's a grim picture. But I know you wanted to talk a little bit more about perhaps eagles and things. you were going to yeah, talk about eagles. I, I, I was, and I was going to say, Carol, that really this highlights problems that can arise when you're reintroducing wildlife as well, because the white-tailed eagle also commonly known as the sea eagle. It's a magnificent bird. It's Britain's largest bird of prey, wingspan of up to two and a half metres. They can live a long time if they're not persecuted. The oldest in the wild is thought to be 32 years old now. It was persecuted to extinction in the UK by humans in the 19th century, probably even the 18th century in England. And then in the 1970s, uh, white-tailed eagles were reintroduced in Scotland. And you may well recall media reports when they were reintroduced that eagles were taking lambs from farms, which sounds quite unlikely. And the incidence of, uh, fair to say, put it politely, the incidence of those reports has diminished considerably. They generally eat fish. Other birds, and this is the important thing, are also sometimes occasionally smaller mammals like rabbits and hares. In 2019, six white-tailed eagles were released in England on the Isle of Wight. And there's a, a plan to release more in West Norfolk over 10 years from 2021. And that started, and you told me, Carol, that you've mm. actually seen one well, in Suffolk. I've seen the Holcomb National Nature Reserve. Fabulous, yeah, fantastic. Well, yeah. um, the problem is that they are unloved by the landed gentry and their gamekeepers because they do prey on grouse and other birds stocked by estates for shooting parties. And, of course, if an eagle soars above a shoot, the game birds will scatter and spoil all the fun. Um. As Carol says, two white-tailed eagles uh, were found dead on estates in D Dorset and Sussex, poisoned. Um, it's known that they were poisoned by a rodenticide rat poison. And it's also known what that rat poison was, uh, brodifacum. It's how I pronounce it, <laughs> but we're having an argument about how to brodifacum. <laughs> it, could, it could be Send ideas in. like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but in May last year, more recently, two more were poisoned and found dead in County Antrim in Northern Ireland, poisoned by an insane. So they, they'd come from the reintroduction in the Republic of Ireland. They'd come flown over to Northern Ireland. Uh, and they'd been poisoned by an insecticide. You can immediately see the difficulty, I'm sure, in prosecuting anyone, first of all, in identifying the perpetrators, and secondly, in bringing prosecutions. Who can say where the birds picked up the poison unless that poison is found on a particular estate? 
uh, and how can it be shown that someone has uh, poisoned the bird by laying out poison? Well, it is a criminal offence to leave things like, for example, the insecticide that killed the birds in County Antrim outside where wild animals could consume it. I think the, R the RSPB offered a very substantial mm. reward if anyone could identify where it had been left outside. But nothing seems to come of investigations. And indeed, although there was very, it seems to me, substantial evidence about the poisoning on the estate in Dorset, the police investigated and then closed the investigation yeah. and declined to take it any further. It's just all too difficult. Yes. And so I, th these are the problems that are faced by white-tailed eagles. And remember, there's only a few, mm. you know, being reintroduced. And l losing two is a disaster. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I mean, just sorry, you've asked before you come in. I mean, yeah. you're, you're absolutely correct about the police investigation. I think the HSE were also investigating yeah. uh, and yeah. looking into particularly that issue. Um, and unfortunately, I think that didn't come to anything either. Yeah. But I mean, you know, massive evidential problems, as you're saying. Most of these offences are taking case on private land, yeah. you know, of which there's vast very, areas. very little right yeah. away, public access. And so, you know, gather, gathering that evidence is incredibly difficult. Yeah. The good news on that front is, I think, July this year, um, legal authorization for the most highly toxic uh, rodenticides, the one you said. That one. That one. That one. You can't use that in open spaces anymore, which, again, if it's found in open spaces, is an indication of a sinister intention, isn't it? Yes. And, and, and it brings it into line with various other things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, hen harriers, very much. Uh, in a similar vein to um, eagles, again, driven to extension, extinction in the 19th century, reintroduced in 1960. It is, hen harriers are still the rarest um, bird of prey in England. They're on the red list. Um, in 2013, there were none in England. There are now, well, by last year, there were 36 successful nests and there'd been 141 fledged chicks, but there's, I couldn't find anywhere um, an indication of what the numbers are now in, in, in England in particular. They live obviously in the, in the highlands. They're very much Scotland, lower, lower England, uh, sorry, higher England. Um, the evidence is clear that there's a real conflict between the protection of the bird and grouse shooting, particularly driven grouse shoots. Uh, the research is very clear about it. There was a joint raptor study on it, uh, which there was research called the Langham Moor Demonstration Project. You That's know, right? right? Yeah. yeah. In Scotland, that was. And that, that was quite clear that if the balance was wrong between the hen harriers and the grouse population, then it would make grouse shooting economically not viable. And therefore, there was an economic uh, loss, if that's what you can call it, for um, grouse shooting. Government joint action plan in 2016 aims to increase harrier populations. It had six elements to it, one of which is brood management. Now, brood management is basically where if a second hen harrier nest is established within 10 kilometers of another one, the eggs or chicks from one of the nests can be collected under license and reared in captivity. And then when fledged, released into onto suitable moorland. And if they're collected from a special protection area, they're supposed to be released back into that same area. Um, what it, the theory behind it is that it tries to uh, achieve an even distribution between hen harrier numbers so that they will increase, but not at the expense of grouse shoots. So the really interesting case was the RSPB versus Natural England in 2019. This is a court of appeal case which basically challenged the lawfulness of the granting of licenses to Natural England to take Harrier hen chicks as part of brood management trial. 
Um, and it argued, RSPB argued two points, that Natural England had failed to consider whether there was another satisfactory solution to the problem rather than disturbing the birds and taking them uh, from, from their natural habitat. And that brood management in spas were contrary to regulation 63 of the habitats regulation popped up again. Um, failed on both points because the court says said that brood management is a research project aimed at increasing hen harry numbers and wasn't contrary to regulation 63 partly because there was no evidence that reared chicks were dispersed from their natural habitat because their area is so great you couldn't really prove it so again hen harry Brood management is highly controversial issue, a bit akin to the badger cool, the badger culling. RSPCA say it's wrong in principle and say, why are we moving, removing wild nests and eggs and chicks, often from within spas, um, when we have legislation designated to protect them and those areas are designated to protect them. There are other ways of doing it, diversionary feeding, enforce illegal killing better, licensing grave shoots or banning them until at least the hen harrier is no longer threatened. I mean, I, mean, yeah, I just yeah, jump in. No, well, no, I just because I've just noticed it's uh, we've only got a few minutes left. And, we're, we're and um, I did want to say at least one good news story. Yes. Oh, this. yes, yes. Yeah, let's finish with that. Yeah. Let's and and I don't know whether anybody's got any questions about that. Very, very quickly, just I just wanted to highlight um, one of the things that, that might be on the horizon, which is many people will know the Wildlife Management and Muirburn Bill, which I, I believe may be um, reaching its final peak tomorrow in Scotland and be passed and become an act. Um, and that has great hope, I think, in Scotland. This is a result of the Werity review that was undertaken in Scotland, uh, aims to introduce a licensing regime for game bird shooting and also a licensing regime for muirburn, which is the burning of heather, which is part of the kind of cycle of management of, of, of heather moorland for grants. And um, I mean, the, perf or the wonderful thing about having a licensing regime would be that if you have um, persecuted birds of prey turning up dead on people's estate, you do at least have the uh, possibility that an estate's license could be revoked if it could be shown that that was, um, you know, that that had taken place on their land. So I think, you know, if if that's a hope for the future in terms of what's happening in Scotland, and if it goes well in Scotland, who's to know yeah. that it might not happen right. here? And I think that would be um, that would be a really good step forward. So I just wanted to say that because obviously no, we have that's a great to finish very, very on the good, good note. Lot of doom and gloom, haven't we? But I didn't yeah. know whether you want to have me. We've got a... no, no, no. That's great. I think that's a, that's perfect um, place to stop. We've got. A couple of minutes do we want to take a couple of questions yeah yeah um one from someone called emma who says regard regarding removing hedgerows yeah what is to stop people taking things into their own hands and removing hedgerows not approved by the correct regulatory bodies For fines fines For doing it is the answer to that are they big fines um i think i think it's um Unlimited in the Crown Court, right? And on indictment, the, the, yeah. yeah. And there's most of most cases will be dealt with by magistrates, and I think there is a limit. And I don't know what the fine. Okay. Figures. One question on oh, uh, two questions on factory farming. Factory farming is a le leading cause of pollution of air and water pollution uh, and destruction of habitats and rivers as a result of the mm -hmm. pollution. Ammonia from slurry leads to both particulate matters in the air and nitrogen uh, deposition in the land, which leads to eutrophication of water. Is there an argument to be made that Natural England and DEFRA are ignoring this obvious threat to protected species and red lists and birds and fish? Definitely agree with that, but I wouldn't say necessarily DEFRA and um... And Natural England, I'd say it's more the Environment Agency. A very interesting case that we've been doing for River Action. Uh, we were in court in Cardiff just over a month ago, and that was looking at precisely this issue, intensive poultry units. Right. And then, um, you know, the, the uh, chicken poo from those intensive poultry units being used by farmers to spread on their fields. Yeah. Then it rains, all the so, you know, mm. straight into, straight the, into the river Y, yeah. and the river Y now obviously used to be an iconic, fabulous river for salmon, SAC, you know, all the rest of it. That's one of the cases, when I was talking about the Harris case earlier, yes. was, um, that's one of the cases in which the Harris case has been cited. Because you see. use that 
for EU law, exactly. Yeah. River wires and SACs, so it's the same kind of principle. The issue there was, yeah, diff diffuse agricultural pollution, but unfortunately the Environment Agency were not enforcing, or our client was arguing they weren't enforcing the farming rules for water, which could have been an answer to that problem. So we need to kind of wait and see what happens on that case. Uh, hopefully we'll get a judgment in the next month or two. Right. Ping it out to us. We will. All right, on that point, I think we should stop. We're six o'clock, over six o'clock now. Um, we will, there's another few questions here. We will answer them. I will answer them by email. I think we've got some emails here. We, we, we don't mind if anyone emails us with a question. Yeah. We'll be very happy to email you back. Absolutely. Yeah, more than happy. So I think, thank you everybody for joining. We hope it was interesting and see you again. But we'll just say before we go that this has been a real skim. Yeah, it has. Uh, oh. Yeah. And we can uh, deal with things perhaps in more detail. Well, perhaps everything. we should have some more, you know, maybe three or four intense ones. Yeah. If anybody or has ideas for things yeah. they'd like yeah. to know yeah. more about, that'd yeah, be great. Exactly. Yeah, let All us right. know. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, very Thank much, you so everyone. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye.